All right, so thank you uh, everyone for coming to part two um, of our webinar series with Christy Rosati from Busman. Um, like we were saying, this is part two, it's about an hour and a half long. Um, so Christy, you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Thanks. Yeah, today we are going to be uh, diving all the way into the weeds of UL508A Supplement SB for how we determine the short circuit current rating of an industrial control panel. Um, I'm going to do the same thing I did last week where I'll send um, a copy of this presentation to uh, Nicole and she can send it out to all of you. So um, I'm not saying don't take Serious notes if that's your style, um, but just know that you'll have a copy of this presentation at the end anyway, uh, so you don't have to write everything down super quick. Uh, so our agenda. Um, oh, I do also want to just state, uh, if you have any questions in the middle of this presentation, this is usually the one where I get the most questions because we can get pretty complicated. So feel free, um, you know, take yourself off mute, ask your question for everyone, um, or you can send it in through the chat and um, Nicole will let me know when, when one comes in through the chat. Either way, please, please, though, feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, so our agenda today, first and foremost, we're going to understand some key terms and definitions. That's always what we have to do first, right? Uh, then we're going to determine the overall panel short circuit current rating. We're going to go through all of those steps, and then we'll go through some examples and practice problems. Um, so this is just a little review from last week, right? What is short circuit current rating? That's the uh, prospective fault current to which my um, assembly can be connected to without sustaining damage exceeding defined acceptable criteria. Those criteria are shock, fire, and projectile hazard. So that's what I'm trying to avoid with an adequate short circuit current rating. Um, and with that, we'll start with some of my uh, definitions, the first being the uh, definition of an industrial control panel. Um, so according to NEC Article 100, my definition of an industrial control panel is an assembly of two or more components, so it's got to be at least two components, that consists of power circuit components, control circuit components, or a combination of power and control circuits. So we will talk about what each of those uh, circuits are uh, in a moment. But it's really important to note the industrial control panel does not include the controlled equipment, right? So if it's not in the box, um, you know, then it's not part of the panel. It has to be in the box uh, to be considered part of the industrial control panel. Um, so my, uh, this is one of the, probably one of the most important definitions that we learn is the difference between the power circuit and the control circuit. And the reason it's so important because, is because we, SCCR applies to the power circuit, um, but it does not apply to the control circuit. So we get to ignore everything in the control circuit. Um, so it's really important we can identify what's in a power circuit and what's in a control circuit before we can figure out what the short circuit current rating is. So my power circuit are conductors and components of my branch and feeder circuits. Now, we haven't defined branch and feeder circuits yet. That's on the next slide. Um, but essentially what those are going to do is those, that's going to tell you that it's anything in between my supply and a load. So if it's between my supply and a load, an outside load, that's going to be a power circuit. Um, a control circuit, that's electrical signals, inputs, outputs, things like that. Most, A lot of times it's at a different voltage, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, and it's usually limited to 15 amps. Uh, again, it could be, it could be more, um, but for the most part, smaller, um, you know, smaller amounts of amps. And, it, and they're generally, you know, um, just those electrical signals, turn, you know, turn this contactor on or off, something like that. Um, so it's really important, we, again, we, we can identify whether something is in the power circuit or the control circuit. Um, so, you know, I usually go through some of the, the weird examples here. The first one going to be, um, you know, the, mentioning that, you know, this doesn't actually mention voltage, right? This doesn't tell me that my power circuit's my 480 volt part of my circuit and the control circuit's the 24 volt DC or 120 volt, right? It just says, you know, whether or not it's feeding the load is really what determines whether it's a power circuit. So if I have a receptacle on the outside of my panel that I can come in and I can plug, you know, a machine to shine the floor into it, that means it's part of the power circuit, right? Just be, even though maybe my main panel is at 480 volt and that receptacle is at 120, um, you know, it doesn't matter as well. If it can feed a load, then it's part of my power circuit. I might also have you know, maybe some um, servo drives that feed an outside load that are at a different voltage. I might have, you know, a one 120-volt motor or something like that 
still part of my power circuit, um, you know, if it's beating that outside load. Um, another, um, you know, quirk of this power reverse control circuit I always go to is is a heater inside the circuit, right? So that's that's just, you know, this panel is going to go outside and it's going to go outside somewhere in the northeast and in the winter you're going to want to be able to make sure you can heat up the inside of that panel um does that heater count as a load does the you know does what feed that count as a power circuit or as a control circuit um and that's actually still control so if something is inside the enclosure and it feed in it uh controls the environment of the enclosure it is control um, so a heater that is still within the in the panel that counts as control. A lot of people think sometimes that's power, um, but that one would be control. A fan, right, right on the right on the um, inside the box there to cool it off. Same thing. That's going to be control. Um, and then if I have uh, an AC unit though that hangs outside of the box. That counts as power because it's no longer uh, in the panel. That counts as an outside load. I know it's a really, really weird uh, distinction, but an AC unit hanging off the side of the panel is power, um, but a fan or a or a heater on the inside is control. I don't make the rules. I just tell you what they are. <laughs> um, so those are a couple of ones of the uh, you know the the weird ones there. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that, oh, um, solenoids. Some people ask me about solenoids. Is solenoid power or control? And a solenoid is going to be control. Um, and that's really just any sort of energizing of a coil, which is really what you're doing with a solenoid. But it would be the same thing as what you were doing, you know, with a contactor. You energize a coil there to close it. Um, and energizing a, a coil in order to operate something is going to count as control. Um, so some of the uh, exceptions you see over there where SCCR just doesn't apply to these types of devices. So these types of devices just simply don't have a short circuit current rating, and you can ignore them in your circuit. The big ones here, transformers, um, you know, they just don't have one. So even if you have if you have a power transformer in there, it's not going to have an SCCR, and that's fine. It's, it's not supposed to. Um, and then any line filters, right, EMI, RFI, line filters on the, the line or load side of your drives also don't have one. That's, a, that's probably another one of the biggest ones I get questions on. Um, if you have a cord and plug connected uh, AC unit, that won't have an SCCR. And then finally, wiring ferrules. So wiring ferrules um, used to not actually really be in UL. It took them a while to add wiring ferrules into UL 508A. Um, now they've said they're fine. They don't have an SCCR, provided that you, you, know, you just install them per manufacturer's instructions. So the ferrules themselves don't affect the SCCR. You can, you can just pretend like they're regular old um, you know, connectors at that point. Um, so if anyone has any questions, again, feel free to ask. Um, now we'll get into the definition of a branch and a feeder circuit. So these are a little more obvious, right? My branch circuit is going to be um, conductors and components following the last overcurrent protective device before my load. Most of the time that's a breaker or a fuse, but in industrial control panels, it can sometimes be like a combination motor starter, right? Like a manual motor protector or something can be there uh, as well. But whatever, I, I find that last overcurrent protective device before my load and anything between that and my load is part of my branch. Um, so you can see in this example here, it looks like we've got a fused switch and a contactor, right? So the fused switch is the last overcurrent protective device. The contactor is also between there and my load, so that whole thing is my branch. Breaker, contactor, fuse, drive, whatever. Um, all of that's going to be my branch. Feeder circuit is anything that on the supply side of a branch circuit, so anything that feeds a branch is going to be part of my feeder circuit. Um, so in this case, right, it's going to be the main switch and power distribution block. Those are going to be part of my feeder circuits, anything that supplies my branches. Um, you can see all of these are going to be part of my power circuit because they are all going to be supplying external loads, right? They're between that supply power and a load, so they are part of my power circuit. Um, whenever I uh, have overcurrent protective devices in there, so this is where 
The UL 508A and the NEC have a definition for branch circuit overcurrent protective device um, that don't necessarily match what a UL 508A calls branch a branch, right? So uh, UL 508A says it's that last overcurrent protective device before my load, but the definition of a branch circuit overcurrent protective device um, is that it has sort of that full range of overcurrent protection. So it can go anywhere between its rated current and its interrupting rating. It's the top level of protection, um, and this can actually be used anywhere. So a branch circuit overcurrent protective device, um, and these are mostly going to be my class fuses and my UL489 breakers, um, these can be used anywhere. So they can be used in my feeder circuit or in my branch circuit. And I know it gets confusing because it's called this branch circuit overcurrent protective device. I don't know why they do this to us. But the branch circuit overcurrent protective device is that top of the level protection, and it can be used anywhere um, in both my feeders or my branches. Um, so here are my acceptable branch overcurrent protective devices, right? When we talk about fuses, um, those are my UL248 fuses. Those are the fuses that have the word class in front of them. So class CC, class J, class, um, you know, RK1, RK5, any of those branch circuit overcurrent protective devices. Most of the time in an industrial control panel, we're going to be dealing with a UL489 molded case circuit breaker, um, a UL1066 low voltage power breaker, insulated case breakers technically count as branch circuit overcurrent protective devices. We usually don't start using those until we're over 1200 amps. And if you're using something over 1200 amps in your industrial control panel, um, you've got a very, very special application there anyway. So the vast majority of industrial control panels, we're talking class fuses um, and the UL489 molded case circuit breakers. Um, and again, acceptable in my feeders or my branches, even though, so we're using the NEC definition of a branch here um, and not the UL definition. So I always like to clarify that uh, up front too. Um, and that is just a, you know, it, as far as the NEC co is concerned, there's really two types of overcurrent protected devices, a branch overcurrent protected device and a supplementary overcurrent protected device. So the branch can be used anywhere. It's that top of the level uh, protection. Supplementary is limited protection that should only be used in addition to branch circuit overcurrent protection devices. Really, for the most part, we should be limiting these to control circuits only. Um, so that's my UL1077 supplemental protectors. Those are my midget fuses and my glass fuses. Um, I want to make sure those are those are a much, much lower level of protection. Um, and I want to limit those to my control circuits only um, to be if I want to be you know properly apply these. Um, so with that, my, uh, I think my final set of definitions here are is going to be a power transformer and a control transformer. Um, so a power transformer is a transformer whose secondary supplies a load. Um, it might also supply a combination of loads and the control circuit, right? If I have a receptacle on the outside of my panel that's 120 volts and that's a load, and I also have 120 volt control power, I'm not going to have two separate transformers, one that goes to the control and one that goes the power, um, you know, it's going to be the same and, and feeding both. But if it goes to a load at all, it could be a load plus the control, but if it goes to a load, it's going to be a power transformer. Uh, if it goes to control only, so no loads off of that transformer, then it is a control transformer. So it's really important we know, right, the power transformer, we include those in our panel short circuit current rating, right, because they're in that circuit path to a load, so they're part of my power circuit, so I have to include everything there. Control transformers, I don't, right? So um, when I have a control transformer, uh, the primary protection for that control transformer counts towards my short circuit current rating, but everything at the transformer and down, uh, I get to ignore. So in this uh, sample panel here, right, we have, uh, you know, a main circuit breaker to power distribution blocks, and you can see I, I have a couple branches, um, and then I have a, a supply to my uh, control circuit, my control power transformer. So right, in this, in this case, my branch circuits are going to be that last overcurrent protective device before my load. So you can see I've got my motor circuit protectors and a contactor, so it looks like i got sort of some sort of starter here, and then I have a circuit breaker 
to uh, soft start. Um, so the, I, I take that last overcurrent protected device, so my motor circuit protectors and my circuit breakers here, and I can say those are going to be the starts of my branch, and anything in between that and my load is going to be part of my branch. Um, my feeder circuit, right, anything on the supply side of my branch circuit, so in, that, in this case that will be that molded case circuit breaker and the power distribution block. Uh, and then it's just really important that I remember um, that the primary protection for my control circuit counts. So once I get to the, that, if that is truly control all on the secondary there, I can ignore it, but I've even covered it up. Um, but that primary protection in this case, those fuses, um, will count towards my short circuit current rating. That's true if it is a transformer or a power supply. The primary protection for it counts towards my short circuit current rating. All right, so with that, we've, we've gone through all of our definitions. Now we can go through the steps to determining my overall panel short circuit current rating. So how do I determine the short circuit current rating for a panel? Well, I could do the, you know, listing labeling process, you know, via testing. So right, this is where I build my product and I ship it to UL and I pay them a lot of money and they zap it with a lot of current. And if it doesn't create a fire projectile or shock hazard, I know my short circuit current rating for that panel. Um, you know, if I'm building the same thing over and over again, this makes sense. Um, but with industrial control panels, I'm usually doing something custom each time. So that's not very practical. So we use a approved calculation method. As far as I know, in the United States, the only approved calculation method is UL508A supplement SB. Um, hypothetically, you could use another AHJ, that's authority having jurisdiction, uh, approved method. But I don't know of one. If you if you know one, shoot it my way and let me know. Otherwise, UL508A Supplement SB is the way to go. Uh, and UL508A Supplement SB is the way to go regardless of whether or not that panel is getting a UL listing on it. Um, so whether or not you are an approved UL508A shop or not, the de the method to determine the short circuit current rating is this method. Um, again, no matter whether it is uh, a UL panel or not. Um, and then finally, a field evaluation could also be done, right? So a neural laboratory like a TUV or UL could come out um, and do a field evaluation of a panel. But when, when they come out, they're using UL by the way to supplement SB. So that's what we're going to cover here. Um, and it's really important to know that uh, with UL508A, my panel short circuit current rating, it's based on the internal ratings or the components of the the, the ratings of the internal components. And, and when we're talking about those um, components, we're talking about two ratings that they might have, short circuit current ratings and interrupting ratings. Um, so the first, let's talk about interrupting rating, right? So interrupting rating applies to my overcurrent protected devices. Multi-case circuit breakers, fuses are going to have interrupting ratings. Um, and an interrupting rating uh, cannot change, right? So because that interrupting rating if we, is, is defined as the maximum amount of current that that device can safely interrupt, right? These are the devices that are doing something during the short circuit. The breaker's going to trip, the fuse is going to open, and they, are, they can physically only clear safely um, a certain amount. So I could have, you know, 17 current limiting fuses in front of a breaker, but its interrupting rating stays the same, right? Because it's still the maximum amount of current that it can safely interrupt. Um, so really important to know that about interrupting ratings. There's sort of a trick problem about that later. Um, so interrupting ratings for overcurrent protective devices. Um, the other type of rating is short circuit current rating. So short circuit current ratings apply to pretty much every other component that's inside my panel. Drives, power distribution blocks, fuse holders, et cetera, um, are going to have a short circuit current rating. And short circuit current ratings can change because what a short circuit current rating is is it's really an it's a it's a it's the div, it applies to a device that isn't doing something during the short circuit right it's sitting there and it's waiting for an upstream div device to open and protect it right think about a power distribution block when there's a short circuit is a power distribution block doing anything no it's sitting there and it's waiting for that upstream device to open to protect it um, so that short circuit current rating can change depending on what that upstream device is, right? It might have a different short circuit current rating if that's a breaker, um, if it's a class 
RK1 fuse or if it's a class J fuse, right? So there might be different um, short circuit current ratings are variable. There's different types of short circuit current ratings and they can change based on upstream components. Interrupting ratings are always going to be the same value. Um, so when I go to look up my short circuit current ratings, um, honestly, a lot of times this is the sometimes the most time consuming and hardest part about um, figuring out the short circuit current rating of your of your panel. Once you know how to how to apply UL 508A, um, I think this is is actually the the most time consuming part of it, and it's looking up those values. Um, so according to UL. Um, I can use the short circuit current ratings listed on a product label, the installation instructions, and UL's website. Admittedly, these are probably like the three worst places to try and look this up in an efficient manner. <laughs> um, UL's website's like a mess trying to search for it. Uh, and a lot of times you don't have the product physically in front of you, you know, with its installation instructions to look those up. Um, well, what I use, what many of us use, is going to be this the technical publications, catalog publications, and the manufacturer's websites. These are usually way, way, way easier uh, ways to look up short circuit current ratings. Um, the reason I show you this slide is that in the event that there is a conflict between the bottom row and the top row, the top row supersedes the bottom row. Now, there shouldn't be any conflicts, but with millions of SKUs out there, I'm sure there's a couple typos. Um, and I just want to let you know that that top, that top level right there, those are all managed by UL. Um, so those are the official ones, the ones um, below. Again, should match and are usually a way, way easier method to look up this information, um, but is technically for information only, uh, you know, in the event of any sort of conflict. Um, so short circuit current ratings, any, uh, any component that has a short circuit current rating will be tested with an upstream overcurrent protective device to obtain that short circuit current rating. So when I see my uh, short circuit current rating, I will have a value for that component SCCR. Um, and then it will tell me my upstream overcurrent protective device type and size. And when I see a size, that is a maximum size. So anytime I see an amp rating for an upstream fuse or circuit breaker, whatever it is, um, I can always use a smaller amp rating than that. It is always, always, always permitted to use a smaller amp rating, but you are never allowed to go larger amp rating. So uh, it'll have that upstream overcurrent protective device type and size. Um, so you can see here on the example on this page, right, my SCCR, um, right, the, is the basic rating, right, 5KA with a maximum 45 amp fuse. I could use a 40 amp fuse. I could use a 30 amp fuse, and I would still have that 5KA rating, but I cannot use a 50 amp fuse. If I use a 50 amp fuse with this, I am, I am not properly applying this component. Um, and then I could have a maximum 35 amp circuit breaker. Again, I could have a 30 amp circuit breaker, but I cannot put a 40 amp circuit breaker in there. Um, so it's a maximum upstream device. There's another or a trick question on that at the very end, so remember that. <laughs> um, and then finally, they might have some other conditions in there. Typically, when we see other conditions, um, it has to do with conductor sizes. Um, so you have to use specific conductor sizes, um, you know, to comply with certain ratings. Sometimes there's something like a temperature, but more often than not, uh, other conditions would have to do with conductor sizes. Um, and then you might have a high fault rating listed on there, too. So your, your standard rating, your basic rating should be on there. Um, and then a high fault rating, you know, if I use specific upstream uh, uh, devices, something higher than that basic rating. We'll talk all about high fault ratings uh, individually here very, very shortly. So um, there's four types of SCCRs that any electrical component may have, um, a standard fault, a high fault, a group motor installation, and a combination motor controller rating. Um, so we're going to first talk about standard fault. And a standard fault is basically the minimum, right? It's your basic rating. It's the minimum that any component must have when it's tested with any overcurrent protective device. Um, so this should be found on the product label. Uh, in the instruction sheet on UL's website, uh, there's also this default rating um, table. So table uh, SB 4.1. So this is in UL 508A table SB 4.1. 
tells me all of my standard ratings, uh, these default ratings, basically, for different types of components. Uh, and you can see here, right, a lot of these are pretty low. Um, and this is the values that I wind up on my components a lot of times if I'm not, basically if I'm not taking advantage of one of the other types of ratings, right, a high fault rating or a combination rating, something like that. If I'm not taking advantage of one of those, I wind up with a power distribution block that's 10KA, right, or I wind up with a, um, you know, a switch that's 5KA, something like that, right. So that that's the... Um, this is how we wind up a lot of times with lower uh, values is because we, we wind up having to use the standard fault because we haven't taken advantage of one of the other types. So the other types of faults, right, the ones that are a whole lot more helpful are going to be, uh, first and foremost, a high fault rating. So high fault rating is a higher rating. Specifies that maximum amp rating of the overcurrent protector device. So again, uh, when I see that amp rating for a high fault, that's the maximum amp rating. Yeah, I can always go smaller. Um, and I just uh, right found on the product label instruction sheet. Um, this one's actually not on UL's website, which is annoying, but um, found on the product label or the instruction sheet. Uh, and Right, when I look at a high fault example here, if I go back on the right hand side, I look at this contact or I look at that high fault rating, right? I got a high fault rating at 480 volt or 600 volt. 480 volt, it's going to be 100 kA, 20 amp class J fuse. You can actually see here, here it actually specified the class of fuse. It doesn't for the upstream, for the basic rating, right? Basic rating just says 45 amps. Uh, that can be any any class of fuse really it's going to assume you're using a branch rated fuse um, but other than that you know it doesn't specify that so high fault rating you might get a lot more specific with a class of fuse um, but what you'll notice it still doesn't it's still not part number specific when I have a high fault rating um, I always say it's kind of like a generic combination rating and we haven't talked about the combination rating yet but it's not part number specific it's sort of um, a generic right it tells me any class J fuse it doesn't tell me I got to use Bussman LPJ-20 SP you know it just says any 20 amp class J fuse so that's sort of the generic high fault rating um, that we get there um, and then you can see we've got a 600 volt high fault rating as well um, and no high fault rating with a circuit breaker. Um, when I go over to this power distribution block, if I read through the uh, the paragraph up there, it could say this is going to say I've got to use the gauge wire that is it says is protected and a maximum class J fuse. So it says class J up there in that paragraph. Um, rather than down in the in the little chart. Um, and if I don't use one of those, it's 10 kA. So right, my basic rating is written in there too. And you can see I can have a couple different short circuit current ratings based on the size of that fuse and the size of the of the wire uh, that I am using there too. Uh, my next type of short circuit current rating is a group motor installation. So um, group motor is, is a specific way of designing your panel, um, and it's, you know, completely allowed by uh, UL508A as long as you follow a couple rules. Um, but it's when you have one overcurrent protector device, so one circuit breaker, one fuse, that feeds multiple motor controllers that each feed a motor load, right? So one circuit breaker, multiple controllers, each go into their own load. Uh, it's similar to a high fault rating in that it's probably going to be, you know, a lot higher than the standard fault rating. Um, but what you do here is, is you know, as opposed to if you used, you can imagine, right, the size of that circuit breaker when it has four of those motors attached to it, that's going to be a larger amp rated circuit breaker than if you had one for each branch. Um, so it might be a little bit lower than what it would be if you had one for each branch. Uh, it's really just a matter of, you know, group motor ratings, you're going to find a separate group motor short circuit current rating. So when you're looking up these values for short circuit current rating, and if you are installing something as a group motor, um, you just have to find that group motor rating. Um, there are other requirements, uh, you know, that you have to follow. You have to have overload protection on each of those. Um, and, you know, you have to follow your tap rules. You're only supposed to have so many connected. Um, so you just want to make sure you're, you're following all of those. Those are sort of separate from SCCR, but very important for the proper installation of group, group motor. Um, and, and, and then you'll see it like that. So when I look up my group motor uh, installation here, you can see, right, 
it says for use in group motor application. So we're looking at some manual motor controllers for use in group motor application. You can see I have the value of that short circuit current rating. Um, and then I also have a maximum upstream protected device amp rating. Right, so this is telling me I can my my maximum size for that upstream fuse, maximum size for that upstream breaker. Um, you know, in this particular example, that's a pretty large upstream maximum fuse and maximum circuit breaker. You know, for the size of the the horsepower motors that we're connecting here, um, but sometimes that's going to limit how many you can add into a single circuit. Right, sometimes that that value is not 600. Sometimes that value is 30 amps, right? So you can only connect so many before um, you might get some nuisance opening on there. Um, but that's your maximum upstream protective device along with that. Um, you have straight ratings whenever you use something like this. Um, and again, this is a component that has uh, you're going to have a component that's typically going to be overload protection only, and then you're probably going to have some sort of controller, right? Some way, some on-off method in there uh, in addition to that. Um, and then that upstream fuse or circuit breaker. So that's group motor, again, totally allowed. And you can see here, right, this this in particular gets 50 kA. You can get pretty good ratings when you use a group motor application. They're out there and they exist. It's just really important we specifically look up the group motor application value um, because it would be different than what it is if you have one overcurrent protective device per load. Um, so just you use it, use it properly. And then my final type of uh, short circuit current rating is going to be a combination motor controller. So a combination motor controller is a specific combination of components in a branch circuit only that feeds a single motor load. Um, so you'll never see a combination motor controller in a feeder. You'll, you won't see it controlling multiple motors, and it's a specific combination of components. So unlike a high fault rating, uh, where I said it was kind of like a a generic combination ring. This is part number specific, right? So when I look up um, a combination motor controller rating, it is part number X plus part number Y plus part number Z, right? No exclusions, no exceptions, no substitutions, right? It is this part number plus this part number plus this part number. And then when I get that short circuit current rating, that short circuit current rating applies to my combination of components. Um, so I no longer say, well, this one, you know, this, the manual motor protector was a 50 kA and the contactor was a 10 kA, but now that I have the, you know, just you say this plus this plus this equals a short circuit current rating of 65 kA or whatever, whatever it might be. So combination short circuit current rating um, basically means you get one SCCR for the combination of those components. Um, and these are found on UL's website. Um, again, usually still easier to, to use sort of the manufacturer's publications uh, to find this information uh, as opposed to, to that website. Um, so my combination rating here, right, this is my uh, type EF uh, combination motor controller, probably familiar with this, probably very familiar with the Rockwell version of this, looks very, very similar. Um, you have your short circuit and your overload protection. One thing that's really important, uh, when we're applying a device like this, um, I do need this line side adapter. So um, you can see, you know, sort of on the on the line side of this component, you have that I don't know, it looks like three little tubes going into there. Um, that's the line side adapter. And as far as I know, every manufacturer uh, has a device like this. And it's really, really important we use that line side adapter um, if we're using this as a combination motor controller. If I don't have the combination, or if I don't have that line side adapter, um, I technically don't have short circuit protection. Um, and you might say, well, what, how does that make any sense? What well, has to do with UL508A saying, if I'm going to have short circuit protection, I have to have a specific amount of spacing between my phases, right? And it's distance over air and distance over surface. And without that line side adapter, that component does not meet those requirements. With the line side adapter, it does. So it's really, really important. And again, this is not just like an Eaton thing. Uh, I believe this is true all across manufacturers. I need that line side adapter 
um, on this combination motor controller um, to be considered to have short circuit protection. It is absolutely a hazard uh, if I do not. Uh, so really, really important that we use that line side adapter. It's a very inexpensive part, but it, it really, really serves an important purpose. Uh, when we see here, right, with combination ratings, I no longer have a maximum upstream protective device specified, right? Because it's its own self-protected starter. So I don't have a maximum upstream device for me. Instead, I have a short circuit current rating at that voltage. Um, another thing you'll notice here is that voltage, when I go to um, a self-protected starter here, it's a slash rated voltage, right? It's that 480 slash 277 volts. Um, and I just want to take a moment to talk about slash ratings. What a slash rating is what it means when we see it and what it means for our panel. Um, so when I have a slash rating and I look at it, what that means is that first number, right, 480 volt, that larger number, that represents the voltage of a three-phase fault that this can safely interrupt. Great. That second number, that's 277. That's the voltage of a fault that a single pole can safely interrupt. So it's really, really important uh, when we have uh, an application like this that we do not install a slash rated component in a system that can see more than 277 volts on a single pole. Um, so, you know, what that, what that essentially boils down to is if I have slash rated components, I can only install them in solidly grounded Y systems. Any other type of grounded system, um, it is possible for me to see more than that 277 volts on a single pole, and I cannot use slash rated components. Um, so uh, corner grounded delta, a high resistance grounded delta, an ungrounded delta, any of those, anything except a solidly grounded Y system, uh, I am not permitted to use that. Um, so it's, it's very important if I am using slash rated components that I label my panel with a slash voltage rating. Right, so if I use a slash rated component in my panel, the voltage of my panel is not 480 volt. The voltage of my panel is 480 slash 277. Uh, and I've seen people even mark on their drawings, you know, only install in a solidly grounded Y system. Uh, so really important we do that. And, and we see slash rated components uh, in industrial control panels a good amount. Um, and that is because so many of these components are European style, right? They're those IEC components. And what IEC components actually are um, is like, right, what is the voltage that they have in, in Europe, right? So a lot of IEC uh, components are 400 volt straight rated. Um, but they are not 400. They can't meet all of the requirements at 480 volt. So that's why we see above 400 volts, we start to get these slash ratings, um, right? It's still fully rated at 240 volts, but it's slash rated at 480, um, 480 slash 277. So we just really want to make sure if we use slash rated components, we mark our panel properly. Um, we want those to go into only solidly grounded Y systems. Uh, if you if you need something to go into another type of system, you've either got to use fully rated components, um, you know, or see if there's a way that you can, you know, there you can. You, you can get really tricky sort of here and try and turn these slash rated components into straight rated, but it's usually way easier to just use the straight rated component uh, in the first place. So just be very, very aware of that when you're using slash rated components. Now, the good news is, right, the majority of systems in the United States are solidly grounded Y, so you can use slash rated components on them. But the ones that aren't, the let's say 20 to 15 percent of systems that are not solidly grounded Y, are industrial applications. Um, so they're your automotives, they're your, well, you know, uh, sawmills and things like that. So, um, you know, which is a lot of times where our machines are going into. So we just, again, just be very, very aware of that slash rating. So, all right, we are finally done with some definitions and terms and all of the types of my short circuit current ratings and I actually get to calculate the overall panel short circuit current rating. So halfway through the presentation, we can finally do this. Um, so to determine the short circuit current rating uh, of my whole panel short circuit current rating, I got four steps. Uh, step one is to determine the SCCR of each branch circuit. Step two, determine the SCCR for each feeder component. 
Step three, identify all of my interrupting ratings inside this panel. And step four, pick the lowest value from steps one through three, and that is the panel short circuit current rating. So we'll go through each of these steps individually, um, you know, really important. Step step one is by far the most complicated. We will spend the most time easily on uh, step one here. There's two parts to it. Um, so we want to determine the short circuit current rating for each branch circuit. First, we identify all of my component short circuit current ratings of each branch device. And then B, I determine if my branch component SCCR can be raised using feeder components. We'll talk about exactly what that means. Um, but first and foremost, right, the SCCR of each of my individual power circuit components. So what short circuit current ratings can I use for these power circuit components? Well, I can use whatever's marked on the instructions, right? I'm always allowed to use that. I'm allowed to use that rating that was in that table, SB 4.1, that default rating, uh, that basic rating. I can always use that one. I probably don't really want to use either of those two because they're going to be probably around the 5 or 10 kA, but I am always permitted to use them. Um, I can use the high fault rating, right? So as long as I'm using it with the specified, you know, upstream overcurrent protected device, I can go ahead and I can use that high fault rating. Um, and then there are actually some uh, allowable substitutions when I'm using a high fault rating. Um, so unlike that combination motor controller rating where I said like no sub, it is part number specific, no substitutions, exclusions allowed, um, there are a couple um, times where you are allowed to substitute for a high fault rating. Um, and the first one, um, really what these all boil down to is I can use an equivalent or better current limiting device than what is specified. So exception number one tells me that I can use a fuse with equal to or less than peak let through current, and I could substitute that for the one that's specified. Um, so here you can see, uh, you know, this is sort of my degrees of current limitation, right? An RK5 is the least current limiting, RK1 more current limiting than that, J more current limiting than that. The cube fuse, if you're aware of the Bussman cube fuse, that's equivalent to the J, um, so those are substitutable. And then a Class CC fuse is the most current limiting at all. So one of the most common uses of this exception is that you have a device that's, you know, less than 30 amps, and it's specified with a Class J fuse. Well, I could use a Class CC fuse, because that peak let through current is going to be lower, and a Class CC fuse is smaller and less expensive and, you know, easier to put in a finger-safe uh, holder. So I use a Class CC fuse instead. So I am allowed to substitute a more current limiting fuse uh, for the one that is specified. I'm always permitted to do that with a high fault rating. Now, the really important thing to do that is this is allowed with a high fault rating. So I can tell it's a high fault rating if it tells me use anything of the, you know, a max amp of this class of fuse. If it gives me a part number of fuse, and a lot of drives are specified with a part number of fuse, right? It doesn't just say use a class J fuse in front of this drive. It says use this specific Busman DFJ fuse. If it gives you a part number, that is a combination rating. Um, so it, when you see a part number specified, uh, you cannot use this substitution, right? Because you might say, oh, I would love to use, uh, you know, this drive is specified with a class T fuses. I don't like class T fuses. Uh, class J fuses ha are equally current limiting. Let me use a class J fuse instead. But if it told you a specific part number of a class T fuse, you got to use that specific class T fuse. So just be very, this is the one time you just want to be careful using this exception. If it tells you a part number, don't substitute it. If it tells you a generic class of fuses, then you're allowed to do this um, substitution. Um, the next is, and, and we'll really show you this example, but if my uh, protection is being provided in the field, which this is really uh, an example where maybe I have an outside safety switch feeding me and then I'm allowed to, if I use a specific marking, then, then I'm allowed to, to do that. And I will show you an example of this sort of at the end of this presentation. So I'm just going to kind of skip it for now. Um, the next one is it, I can use a more current limiting breaker. Right, so I can use a listed current limiting breaker with equal or less than peak let through and I squared T substituted for my specified breaker, um, provided that the specified breaker is current limiting. So I can replace a 
breaker with a more current limiting breaker. Same exact sort of concept as the fuses, right? So I gotta look up my lead through charts, make sure they are, but if they're both marked current limiting, um, then I can substitute the more current limiting breaker for the one specified. Uh, and then finally, I can use a current limiting fuse um, and replace any non-current limiting over current protected device. So if I had a non-current limiting breaker specified with something, I could put the fuse in there and keep the high fault rating it had. Now, most of the time, a component is going to have a separate rating with a fuse versus what it had with the breaker. But if in the event that it did not, it only had a rating with the breaker, you could substitute that fuse and keep the high fault rating. Um, so really, all of these exceptions are telling you could use a better device, better using more current limiting device uh, than what was originally specified and still keep that high fault rating. That's what all of these exceptions basically boil down to. So that's, right, that's step 1A, identify my short circuit current ratings. I find out what all those short circuit current ratings are. Step B, this is by far the most complicated. This is what we're going to spend probably the most time on of all of these steps. To determine if my branch component short circuit current rating can be raised using feeder components. So what, what does that mean? What type of feeder components can I use? Well, I can use a power transformer. I can use a current limiting circuit breaker, I can use a current limiting fuse, or I could use a current limiting breaker or fuse applied in the field with specific markings, which we will review individually. Um, so let's talk first about a power transformer. So in this example, right, I have a power transformer feeding my branch, so in front of my branch into that. And this transformer could be changing my voltage, right? So this could be an example where I had, um, you know, one load that's 120 volts where everything else is 480 volts, or this could be an example where I'm just really, really trying to help myself out, and this is a 480 to 480 volt transformer, uh, either way. Um, but what I do, what I do when I have this transformer is I uh, look up my transformer on table SB 4.3 or SB 4.4. Um, one of those is three-phase transformer, one's a uh, single-phase transformer, so depending on which one I have. I look up that transformer uh, on that chart, and it will tell me what its secondary short circuit current is, right? So any transformer is basically just a hunk of impedance, and there is only so much current that can possibly get through there. You can have an infinite amount of current on the primary, and only so much current can get through to the secondary. So I find out what that value is, and if that value of that short circuit current rating is lower than all of my component ratings downstream, my, that branch interrupting rating or component SCCR, if it's lower than that, then the short circuit current rating for this whole branch becomes the uh, the interrupting rating of my primary protection for this transformer. So we'll do an example because it can, uh, that's a lot of words here. So right, what we're looking at, we have a single phase 3 kVA transformer with a 120 volt secondary. Um, so right, single phase transformer, that's table SB 4.3. Um, if it were a three phase transformer, I would go to SB 4.4, but it's a single phase transformer, so SB 4.3, single phase transformer, and I look up a three kVA transformer with a 120 volt secondary. All right, three kVA transformer, 120 volt secondary tells me that my short circuit current, my available short circuit current through there is 1200 amps. Um, so if 1200 amps is lower, then my downstream components interrupting ratings, short circuit current ratings, in this case it is, right, because I've got 10 kA and 5 kA, and last time I checked, 1.2 is less than 10 and 5. Um, then the short circuit current rating for this whole branch gets to be the interrupting rating of the primary protection for this transformer. In this case, I'm using a fuse, so it has a 200 kA interrupting rating, so this whole branch 200,000 amp rated. So it's a 200 kA rated branch from the transformer down. Now, really important to note, uh, th if this is the case, it doesn't automatically mean that everything is 200 kA. Uh, it only means that if I'm using a 200 kA interrupting rating fuse, right? If I have a 10 kA breaker protecting that transformer, everything's 10 kA. Right, so you don't automatically make it 200, you make it the interrupting rating of whatever is protecting that transformer. So I really, I'm gonna, you know, take a moment here. I don't do another example of this uh, in this, in this uh, 
presentation or even tomorrow uh, in the part three of the presentation. So I really want to make sure this makes sense before I move on. So if anyone has a question, send it through the chat or just ask it out loud. I really want to pause and make sure this makes sense. Um, you know, just because we're not going to review it again. It's all about that short circuit current being less than my downstream ratings, and then I can steal that interrupting rating for the primary protection as the SCCR, the whole branch. I'm going to give it, in case you're typing, <laughs> give you a minute. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. But if one comes through, I will happily come right back um, and do that. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about, right? So we talked about a power transformer being able to uh, help me out, but I can also use a current limiting circuit breaker or a current limiting fuse. Um, so I just want to show you a little demonstration about why current limitation, you know, can basically help me out here. What does current limiting really mean? Um, and so uh, we've got this cable whip test uh, that, that is a really, really good visualization of current limitation. So this is a 480 volt circuit. Um, and I've got 90 feet of 2-watt conductor. 2-watt conductor you are probably all familiar with, right? But it's about the diameter of a quarter or so. Um, and it's not particularly flexible, but it's got a little bit of bend to it. My fault current is 26,000 um, RMS, symmetrical fault current. Um, and what I'm going to do is I've got a one-cycle opening non-current limiting device. So that's basically a breaker, right? One-cycle opening non-current limiting, that's most breakers um, that way. And we're just going to see what happens to this cable. So a lot of energy there, right? A lot of energy getting through. My uh, my peak let through was 48,000 amps, <laughs> um, and my clearing time 16.7 milliseconds. Um, that's pretty fast, right? One cycle, it's, it's pretty fast. And I always like to emphasize, this is a legal code application, right? This is what's normally, this is a circuit breaker, uh, properly sized circuit breaker protecting this. Um, so a legal code application, this is why we have things like torque ratings and why we put conductor and conduit, right? Um, it's because of this, but there's just a lot of mechanical energy uh, that gets let through, uh, you know, even during just one cycle of a short circuit. The next test is we put a 200 amp current limiting fuse in there. And a current limiting fuse, by definition, must open in a quarter cycle or, or less. So same exact test, um, but with a current limiting fuse. And I suggest when we watch this, kind of staring where those conductors cross in the middle. Hmm. Did everybody see that? <laughs> Just a little, like, twitch there, and that was it, right? So my peak let through there was 10,000 amps. My clearing time was 4 milliseconds. So my mechanical forces let through, and that's really what we saw the visual representation of here, was 1 25th um, the amount of mechanical forces that were let through. And my thermal energy let through was 1 123rd, that's a factor of I squared T, so that's why it's such a weird number there. Um, but thermal energy led through 1 123rd. So you can imagine, if you are a component in a system, um, you know, I I'd rather be connected to that second system, right? I'm going to have to withstand a whole lot less energy if I'm in the second one versus if I'm in the first one. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about now. So we're going to assume and that we have a current limiting device in our feeder. And I always like to emphasize here, right, this is talking about a current limiting device in my feeder. So this is typically going to be a current limiting main device, right? So my main is my feeder, and then I go to my branch. Um, and what I can do is if I've got a current limiting device in my main, in this case we're going to talk about current limiting circuit breakers, um, one thing about current limiting circuit breakers is that they have to be marked current limiting. If they do not say current limiting physically marked on the breaker, um, then it might be some degree of current limiting, but we don't, it doesn't count. Uh, it doesn't count unless it is marked current limiting. So if I have a breaker that is marked current limiting, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 
you know, my perspective fault current that I'm looking at, and I'm going to figure out the let through current at that amount, right? So whatever that let through current is of that uh, breaker at my uh, perspective fault current, look that up. And if that value, right, is less than my component short circuit current rating, then I can raise the short circuit current rating of that component. One really important thing is that I still cannot use this to increase my branch interrupting rating. Um, so my branch interrupting rating um, is not affected by this let through current process. Only the um, branch component short circuit current rating um, you know, can be raised using this. So we'll do some examples here to make sure we understand. In this, this example, I've got a 100 kA rated breaker, current limiting, uh, and I look up my let through current. So at 100,000 amps, this breaker, right, I go to this, this graph, I go up to my breaker, I go over and I see it lets through 40,000 amps. That's, yeah, that's pretty good, right? It's 60% reduction in the fault current. Not bad, not bad. Um, there's also sometimes tables that show this, so you don't necessarily have to read this this chart, but either one will do. Um, so I've got a current limiting breaker. My let through here is 40 kA, and in my branch, I have a breaker rated 14 kA and a contactor here that's got an SCCR of 22 kA. So did I solve any problems by putting in this current limiting breaker and trying, you know, did I increase the short circuit current rating of this branch? No, I did not, right? It's still going to be 14 kA because, you know, just putting in a current limiting device isn't going to work unless it actually limits the current to less than the ratings of the downstream component. So I always show this one because sometimes people think, well, I got a current limiting fuse or I got a current limiting breaker in my main. Uh, I'm fine. But you actually have to verify that it, it you know, it, it limits the current too lower than those ratings. So uh, in this case, those components were still rated too low, so it did no good. Now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to change out those components to components with higher ratings. So now I have a breaker with the 65 kA interrupting rating, and my contactors has a 50 kA interrupt, er, short circuit current rating. Now, 40 kA is less than those values, and I can help, right? Now, my short circuit current rating of this branch will be raised. What will it be raised to? Well, in this case, because this breaker is only rated 65, I can only raise it to 65 kA, um, right? So that the short circuit rating of that contactor, that could be raised higher, but I'm only going to be able to raise the short circuit current rating of this branch to the interrupting rating of this breaker. Just a reminder that, again, it doesn't matter how many current limiting devices we have in front of an overcurrent protected device, an interrupting rating cannot change. An interrupting rating does not get to be helped, does not get to be raised uh, with upstream devices. So if I want to be able to get this um, all the way up to 100 kA, I'm going to have to put a 100 kA rated breaker in there, and now I could raise this all the way up to 100 kA. Um, right, because that 40 will be less than the 100 and the 50, and I can raise that 50 all the way up to 100. But I can't raise it up um, without that interrupting rating being higher. And again, I'm going to pause here for a second, just make sure this makes sense to everybody before we move on. Um, all right, we look up the let through current, lower than my short circuit current ratings downstream, then I can raise it. Um, I will I will come back if any other questions come through. Um, and now we're just going to do right the same thing with the fuse. Um, so if I have a branch circuit supplied by a class C, C, G, J, L, RK1, RK5, or T, so any current limiting fuse, um, I can do pretty much the same thing. Um, but there's a couple uh, things about fuses that make it a little different, right? So I have this let through current. My let through current is lower than my branch and my component SCCR. I can, you know, raise it again, never higher than my branch interrupting rating. Um, but there's one really weird quirk that we worry about um, with fuses. <coughs> uh, and that is what uh, we can raise um, that short circuit current rating to. So with fuses, unlike with breakers, with breaker, when we looked up that let through current, we looked at the manufacturer's table, right? And we saw, here's the breaker I'm using. Here's the let through current. Um, I don't get to do that with fuses. With fuses, I have to use this table. Um, this is table SB 4.2 uh, within UL 508A. 
And what this table shows me is it shows me UL's limits of let through current for any class of views. And the reason they make us do this is because hypothetically, um, everyone on this call, you're using beautiful yellow Bussman fuses throughout your whole panel, um, but their customer, you know, they get it on site and one of those fuses opens and they replace it, you know, with somebody else's fuse. Uh, and what we want to make sure is that the short circuit current rating doesn't get messed up just because they put a different fuse in there. So we have to use these uh, threshold limits um, for my fuses. So it's a little bit annoying because in the actual let through value of the fuse that you are using is probably a little bit better, um, or, you know, either a little bit or a lot better than what this shows. But, you know, we have to use it. But the good news is, you know, you don't have to look up each individual fuse. You use one chart no matter what you're doing. Um, so, you know, kind of easy in that way. So we look it up by fuse class here. We look up the amp rating of my fuse. Um, the other thing is you can see there's three different columns, right? There's a 50 kA column, there's a 100 kA column, and there's a 200 kA column. Um, and, and it's really important we, we pay attention to which column we're using because depending on which value of let through current we use, and we use that peak let through value, right? So I, P, the second uh, in each of the columns. Um, we use that, and then de depending on which column we've used, whatever available fault current, that is the short circuit current rating we can raise my branch to, right? So I don't just get to raise it up to 200 kA because that was the interrupting rating of the fuse. I raise it to the column for what let through current I'm looking at. So we'll we'll do an example again, just so that kind of makes more sense. Um, but you can see here, right? With a we're going to be using in our example a 200 amp fuse here, but you can see, right, at 50 kA, it lets through 16 kA, at 100, it lets through 20, and at 200, it lets through 30. So depending on which of those values I'm using in my calculation, that's the whatever column, uh, that's what I can raise my short circuit current rating to. Uh, so here, right, we'll, we'll take the first example, scenario one. I've got a beautiful fusible switch here. It lets through 20 kA, so, right, that's better than even the breaker did. Uh, let's do 20 kA, but downstream I have a device with an interrupting rating of 14 kA and 22 kA. Have I solved all of my problems with short circuit current rating by putting a current limiting fuse in the main? No, I wish it worked that way, right? I still have a 14 kA rated branch here. Right. I, I always, again, emphasize this point that, you know, you actually have to verify that that let through is less than all of your downstream component ratings. Otherwise, you haven't done yourself any good. You still have a pretty low rated panel, um, you know, when it comes to this example. So, OK, we're going to fix that. We're going to take that uh, circuit breaker out and we're going to put in some fuses. Right. So we've got um, fuses in a fuse holder, 200 kA rating. Now is my 20 kA less than 222? Yes. Great, wonderful. That means I can actually help myself. What can I raise the short circuit current rating of this branch to? Well, I can raise it to whichever column I got that 20 kA from. So that 20 kA, that is what it lets through when there's 100 kA available fault current. So I can raise this branch to 100 kA. Um, I don't raise it to 200, I don't raise it to 300, I raise it to 100 because that's where, that is what that 20 kA let through was based upon. Now, hypothetically, could I get it up to 200 kA? Well, at 200 kA, my peak let through was 30,000 amps. So if my peak let through was 30,000 amps, that wouldn't do it, right? Because 30,000 would be greater than the rating of that contactor. Um, so 100 kA is the maximum I'm going to be able to raise this to at all. if Hypothetically, I wanted to raise it to, like, if we lived in a world where 100,000 amps was not enough and we wanted to get it to 200, I, I don't know what world that is, but hypothetically in that world uh, where we really, really wanted it to be 200, um, right, then we have to base it on that 30 kA let through, right? So you can see so the let through change to 30 kA because that 30 kA is what it is at 200. And I'm going to have to replace that. Uh, that contactor, that component, to something with a short circuit current rating of greater than or equal to 30 kA. So now, right, now I can raise this to 200 kA. Um, again, this this is, you know, very infrequently are we in a world where 100 kA is not going to be enough. Um, 
you know, but but these are the, st- I just always like to emphasize, this is a step you would have to take to get it to 200 KA. You probably run into the scenario more often when it's 50 to 100 column, um, right? Maybe you're trying to get something to 65 KA. You'll notice there's no 65 KA column. That's also really annoying. There's no interpolation allowed between the columns. So you have to use either 50, 100, or 200. Um, so if you're trying to get maybe a 65 KA rated panel, you've got to get it up to that 100 KA rating. Um, you know, you'd follow sort of the same. You have to make sure you're using the let through um, for whatever your goal is. I'm going to pause here again and just make sure nobody has any questions. I know this can get confusing. Um, I just want to make sure it makes sense. Again, you'll get a copy of this presentation too. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move on then. Um, here's some really, really important rules when we're applying current limiting devices. Um, so f- first and foremost, right, I, I, I've said this a couple times already. I'm going to say it again. Current limiting breaker of fuse cannot be used to raise the interrupting rating of a downstream over current protected device, right? It is only good for SCCR. You cannot raise the interrupting rating using this method. You also cannot raise the SCCR of a combination motor controller. So if you have, you know, that type F starter where you've got the uh, line side adapter plus MMP plus, you can't raise the SCCR of one of those either. So you can't use it to raise the interrupting rating, can't use it to raise the SCCR of a combination motor controller. Um, Step two, right, you cannot use a current limiting breaker or fuse to raise the SCCR of a component in the feeder, right? So this is using a uh, current limiting breaker or fuse in the feeder to increase the SCCR of a branch component. So this is not feeder helping feeder, uh, right? So it is not feeder helping feeder, nor is it branch helping branch. That's what number three is here, right? A branch current limiting breaker fuse cannot be used to raise the SCCR of a branch circuit current device, right? So it's not feeder helping feeder. It's not branch helping branch. It is feeder helping branch. That's four, right? It's always going to be that current limiting device in your main or in your feeder to increase your branch. So those are the really, really important rules um, that we must follow, uh, you know, to properly apply this step uh, in UL 508A. Um, th- okay, now we're finally, I, I promised you a couple times, right, that I would see this uh, supplied in the field. What is this supplied in the field thing that uh, comes up a lot in UL 508A? And this is, if you can think of an example, right, and this is a very, very common example now where, um, you know, for arc flash and, and shock reasons, people sometimes like to just have a, you know, a safety switch, a fusible safety switch, feed your panel. Uh, right. And if you want to be able to use the fuses in that safety switch, uh, you know, to help the short circuit current rating of your panel, uh, that is fine. You are totally allowed to do that, provided you mark uh, it properly. Um, so in this sample, right, we got this example label. My SCCR might be 100 kA when fed by a maximum 200 amp class J fuse. I am permitted to label my panel that way. Um, and then I have to say otherwise 5 kA, otherwise 10 k, whatever it would be without it, right? Um, so I can label my panel that way. I can uh, essentially take advantage of the fact that I want you to use this upstream fuse. I'm assuming you're using this upstream fuse. Um, you know, I... And, and, and that as a result, my short circuit current rating will be higher. I just have to mark it as to what that upstream device has to be. Um, so a lot of benefits to this, right? It usually reduces that enclosure size itself, cost of it. Um, and again, it's really good for that arc flash um, reason. Um, if I uh, sometimes get questions here, um, you know, some some of the enclosure manufacturers will will give you a sequester box within the enclosure, right? So it's like a box within a box. Um, you do not have to label it this way. And if you're using the box within the box, right? This is only if it is physically outside of the panel. If it's in a different box inside the same panel, it's fine because you are already providing that, right? Um, it's when you are saying you've got to install this being fed from an upstream fuse, then you have to label it this way. Um, so that is that requirement. Um, again, it is it is uh, allowed, encouraged even, I would say, because of arc flash reasons. It's got to have the specific marking requirement on it. You have to mark it when fed by that specific fuse. 
Okay, so we are finally done with step one. <laughs> I told you step one would be the longest one. I think that took about half an hour in of, of itself, but I promise steps two, three, and four go a whole lot faster. Um, so now, right, we've, we've determined the short circuit current rating of each branch circuit. We've found the short circuit current ratings. We've determined if we can raise the SCCR with any feeder components. Now we look at the feeder components themselves. So we determine the short circuit current rating for each feeder component. This is usually, you know, pretty easy. We usually don't have have many feeder components. Um, when we do the ones with the short circuit current rating, right, we're probably going to talk about a power distribution block, some sort of bus bar system, something like that. We just want to make sure we're, you know, proper, properly applying that with upstream devices um, to get the short circuit current rating of that component, right? If I'm not using the specified upstream device to get a higher rating, I'm probably at its default of 5 or 10 kA. Um, another just one thing about uh, short circuit current rating for feeder components is if you're using a fuse in your feeder, um, that fuse is an overcurrent protective device and it has an interrupting rating, but it is in something, right? It's in a holder, it's in a switch, um, and that holder or that switch has a short circuit current rating. So you just want to make sure you're including that. That short circuit current rating should be 200 kA if we're talking about a fuse, but we just want to make sure we're, you know, documenting all of that properly. So that's step two, a whole lot easier for step two. <laughs> step three, identify all of my interrupting ratings for my overcurrent protective devices, right? So the overcurrent protective device in my main, and the really, really important one we don't want to forget about is that primary protection for my control circuit. Um, that is included uh, in my panel short circuit current rating. Um, you know, everything on the secondary, if it's all control, I can ignore it, but I still have to include that primary protection for my control circuit. And then finally, step four, my panel SCCR is the lowest value from steps one through three, right? That is my step four. That's fantastic. Everybody's favorite step, easiest step, pick the lowest value. So with that, we are going to do an example here. And I'm actually going to have you take a look at this example panel, um, you know, and think about it for a little bit. I think I'm even going to have you, if you could, when you get an answer here, um, send it in through the chat. I just want to make sure, you know, we get about, yeah, I want five or six answers. Um, and I don't care if you get it wrong. Just let me know when you basically think you're done calculating. Um, you know, because I don't want to go through this example with everyone until I know you've all had a chance to sort of try to work it out yourself and then we'll go through it all together. Um, so, in this sample panel, right, we've got a main breaker. It's a 100 amp circuit breaker with an interrupting rating of 35 kA. We've got a power distribution block. Uh, default short circuit current rating is 10 kA. It's got a 14 kA SCCR with a 125 amp breaker. We've got sort of branch CD over here. So C is a 15 amp class CC fuse and a holder. Interrupting ratings and the SCCR of the holder, 200 kA. Got a 10 horsepower drive with a default short circuit current rating of 5 kA. Um, and we have an SCCR of 100 kA with a 15 amp class CC fuse. We got break, uh, we've got branch EF. Uh, e is a 15 amp breaker with an interrupting rating of 22 kA. Um, F is a 20 amp contactor with a default SCCR of 5 kA um, or a 22 kA short circuit current rating with a 30 amp or less breaker. And then the primary protection for this control power transformer is a two pole. 6 amp miniature breaker with an interrupting rating of 10 kA. What is the panel short circuit current rating? Again, when you get an answer, when you think you have one, send it in through the chat. When I get five or six answers, then I'll go ahead and move on um, to showing it. Again, I don't really care if you get it wrong. I just want to know that you've, you've sort of thought all the way through it. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a minute. Take a look at these answers now. See what we got. Uh, 10 KAs. All right. Okay. Hopefully you can all see my screen again still. So now we're going to go ahead. We'll go through this all together. Um, so we're going to start, right? What is my step one of determining this is to figure out the SCCR of each of my branch circuits. So we're going to start with branch CD. So I've got my 200 KA 
fuses there. That's easy to just label. Um, and then D was my 10 horsepower drive. The default short circuit current rating is 5 kA or it's 100 kA with a 15 amp class CC fuse. I am using a 15 amp class CC fuse. That means my SCCR is 100 kA. Um, you know, normally at this point, I would look and say, do I have a current limiting feeder that can help me raise my short circuit current rating? Right, that's step 1B. Uh, in this case, no, I don't. It doesn't say anything about this 100 amp circuit breaker being current limiting. So the SCCR of branch CD, the 100 kA. Um, next, I'll go to branch EF. So I've got my 15 amp circuit breaker. Its interrupting rating is 22. My contactor has a default SCCR of 5 kA or 22 kA with a 30 amp or less breaker. I am using a 15 amp breaker that is less than 30 amps. So therefore, the SCCR there is going to be 22. Again, nothing current limiting in my feeder to help me. So the SCCR of this branch is 22. So that's step one, right? SCCR of each of my branch components. Step two is determine the SCCR of each of my feeder components. The only feeder component here I have with an SCCR is going to be my power distribution block. Um, my power distribution block has a default short circuit current rating of 10 kA or it's 14 kA with 125 amp breaker. I'm using a 100 amp breaker. The SCCR of this power distribution block is 14 kA. Right, and that's because again, that's a maximum amp rating for that breaker. So 125 amp breaker, I'm using 100 amp. I can still use that 14 kA because it's lower. Um, so 14 kA rating for that power distribution block. Next step, right? Identify all of my interrupting ratings. I add in that interrupting rating for my main breaker. It's 35 kA. And most importantly, what I cannot, cannot forget to do is include the primary protection for my control circuit. That's my 10 kA miniature circuit breaker. All that's labeled in there now. My panel SCCR is the lowest values from steps one through three. And I have a panel short circuit current rating of 10 kA. Um, so that's looked like that's what everybody put in the chat. So that's fantastic. You all got it right. Um, so that is the panel short circuit current rating. So um, that is, you know, generally my method here. So, you know, as you can see, right, my keys to achieving high short circuit current rating, right, I'm going to have to have high interrupting rating components because the interrupting rating components in both my branches and my feeders, there's no way to improve those with any sort of, you know, black magic of current limitation, right? The interrupting ratings cannot change. So if I want a high assembly SCCR, I have to use high interrupted rating devices. Um, I've got to use branch and feeder components that have a high fault short circuit current rating, right? Um, now I could use the let through, again, increase my branch circuit components using a current limiting over current protective device or the transformer rules, um, but it's easier really if I just have a high fault rating there with an SCCR. So that's, you know, what I'd have to do essentially to achieve that high assembly short circuit current rating. So with that, um, that is all for today, right? We did our, uh, we, we dove into all of the weeds of UL508A, Supplement SB. We figured out how to determine the short circuit current rating. Um, next up is we're going to take that exact same sample panel we just looked at, and we are going to go through it and increase the short circuit current ratings. We're going to talk about some strategies, really for each types of components. We're going to talk a lot about common misapplications I see um, in the uh, UL 508A panels as well, uh, you know, to be able to, to determine all of those short circuit current ratings. So that is next week, same time. Um, that one's about an hour, uh, so we will see you, hopefully, we will see you all next week, and we will go, again, we'll go through that, that same uh, practice problem we just did, and we will just go through it sort of component by component and figure out how to raise the SCCR um, of that panel, different products and solutions and strategies to do that. Um, so with that, right, specify high interrupting ratings. Um, and if you have any questions, I will stick around here for a while. Um, you're going to send them through the chat. Um, you know, you could send them, you could take yourself off mute and ask a question. Either one is fine. But otherwise, I want to thank you all very, very much for joining today. I hope you uh, learned something useful. Um, and I really think next week, uh, again, is that's, you know, it's one thing to learn how to, to determine the short circuit current rating. And then it's also really, really important we know, you know, some strategies for how to get it to be a higher, uh, a higher number than a 5 or a 10 kA. So hopefully I will talk to you all again next week.